Growing up in Harlem, I grew up swimming in the Harlem River. It was a normal thing then. Now, so the Harlem River had a dock. You got to know which way the current is so that you can get to where you can walk out at. So we used to take a popsicle and throw it in the Harlem River to see which way the current was going. Fashion is such that you have to pay attention to the current because the Harlem River is always there, but it's always moving. I can't control that river. Just see which way the current is going and then dive in. When you talk about fashion, you have to talk about hip hop. The style of hip hop has always been more progressive and cooler than anything else in the industry. Hip hop is a culture. Hip hop is about music, it's about fashion, it's about art, it's about entertainment. It's colorful and it's exciting and it's telling a story and it's fabulous. It's ghetto fabulous. Hip hop is going to determine the future. And look what we have today. Growing up in New York City in the early 70s and the 80s was a very, very exciting time. It was electric. It was powerful. It was totally graffiti on the trains. It was kids saying, we're here, this is who we are. So it was a place where we were expressing ourselves and finding ourselves. You would go up and down 125th Street, or you'd go down to the village on 8th Street. It was like a fashion show. Back in the day, with, with hip-hop and fashion, the street was your runway. Hip-hop club culture was our early internet, because that's how we communicated, that's how people saw what you were wearing. Hip-hop changed my life at that young age. It's not something you listen to, it's the way you live. This thing called hip hop was kind of being created at the time. We didn't really understand we were at the forefront of it, but it made us feel good and it kind of connected everybody in the community together. There was a couple of rap acts out, but nobody had equipment. Nobody had money for equipment in New York City. It was very costly. And then there was the blackout. At 9.34 last night, it all went black. The streets, homes, hotels, theaters, restaurants, and the blackout hit Manhattan. And the next day, miraculously, everybody had equipment to become DJs. I'm not sure how they all got that equipment during the blackout, but that then just spread. And before you knew it, now we all had this culture where you did not have to be able to play an instrument. And you were able to be poets of what was going on in your world. What started in the Bronx is hip hop made its way into Queens and out of this small little area of New York City came out, I don't know how many hip hop artists, LL Cool J, Run DMC, Salt and Pepper, Tribe Called Quest, Lost Boys, Onyx, 50 Cents, Ja Rule. I think probably one of the biggest things that made hip hop culture resonate is that it wasn't asking for permission from anyone. It was just being 100% unapologetically itself. When a kid picks up a microphone and just talks about what he or she has witnessed and what he or she wants to see in the world, everybody can relate to that. They were trying to solve a lot of the inner city problems by saying, when we get together and we want to settle a beef, instead of fighting, why don't we have these things called battles, which are break dancing, and this crew was better than that crew. It starts to influence fashion, because if you're doing windmills, well, you can't have pants that are baggy because they're going to hit each other on the bottom. So you have to taper the pants and bring them in. Graffiti was an area to mark your territories. Graffiti then influenced the clothes, the clothes influenced the music, the music influenced the clothes, and it was a very symbiotic relationship between all the elements of hip-hop. When I think of hip-hop, I think of doing it differently. And I think that customization was the, one of the truest and the purest forms of that in fashion. 
It was a lot of competition at a young age to look fresh and look different. Kids used to make fun of you a lot when your clothes wasn't good looking, you had old sneakers, so that's what kind of inspired us. I was already in the parks, listening to the DJs, but what we didn't have was a place to go and buy the uniforms. We would go to the stores and we would buy things and manipulate, edit, tear them up and make it our own. I remember one day, as me and my friends were competing each other with fashion, I thought about my dad's tail. I was like, man, I want to make an outfit. I want to make some jeans, but I want them a little more baggier than what we were wearing. The tail was like, no problem, I got you. He loosened up the legs. He made the outfit exactly how I wanted it. So when I wore that around the neighborhood, everybody's like, oh, man, that's cool. Where'd you get it from? Where'd you get it from? We started making clothing, and I started selling to my friends, and one thing led to another. And People started coming to me, asking me for these outfits. Streetwear and hip hop has always been about being braggadocious, aspiring to be the best, aspiring to have everything that you wanted in life. Harlem, New York is the Hollywood of fashion. Harlem was always the opulence, fur coats, big hats, leather jackets, all that type of stuff. How you doing, brother? How y'all doing? We're going to the crossroads of the cultural world, 125th Street in Harlem. That's where my first store was opening up. I opened uh, the Dapper Dan Boutique in 1982, right? So my store was right here. And that's Park Avenue. We were all up and down this, all the east side. We had the stores over here, right here. When people saw me with nice and decent clothes on, they didn't know I had rats in my building. They didn't know I could look under my sink and say hello to my neighbor, you know? All those things like vanish once you put on some nice clothes. So Dapper Dan started to take the Louis Vuitton and the Gucci and those type of logos, and he started to make custom seats for cars, clothes, obviously without their permission at the time. I said, wow. If they ain't that excited about them symbols, and I can have them walking around looking like luggage, I can make more money off them symbols than I was off the, the crocodiles, alligators, silks, and all that. So I started teaching myself everything about textile printing. And that's what gave birth to what we see today and who I am today, the father of logomania. So if Ralph Lauren gives you one pony, I give you a herd. Nothing you can wear states more clearly that you have arrived than having one of them big brand logos all over your body. The way that Dapper Dan used luxury labels, at the time it was controversial because all the brands obviously felt like he was, you know, stealing and there was copyright laws against using the brand logos in a way that they didn't approve. But to me, it was his way of saying like, look, like you guys don't want to be part of black culture. You don't want to put some of these rappers on and help them and dress them and have them be part of the conversation, even though they're leading the fashion conversation. Luxury brands were like, hey, this guy is taking our prints and using them in a way that we're not happy about. The raid. Oh, God, the raid. The raid ran me underground. Dap gets busted by Sonia Sotomayor, you know, of all people. <laughs> Wonderful lady. And she was doing her job. She came there and she raided me. And I had a coat there. It was a Fendi coat. Black on black, with the Fs all over it, black plongee leather. They did a cease and desist order, and while I was out of town, they raided all my facilities, right? I had a 2,000 square foot factory on 120th Street. I had a three-story building on 125th Street, and I was open 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, never closed. And all of that, all of that was like, phew, in an instant. I stayed ahead of the curve. That's why I say, I didn't knock off, I knocked up. They wasn't doing none of that stuff. So I went into the underground, kept making clothes. And that sustained me for like 35 years. Man.
Back then, no clothing companies at all were paying attention to hip-hop artists. Matter of fact, a lot of clothing companies did not even want hip-hop artists in their clothing because they felt like if hip-hop artists started wearing their clothing, it may deter their original customer from wearing their brand. There was a moment where black people were tired of giving credit and due and money to all of these brands that were then ashamed of us. And so I think that there came a turning point of wanting to create for our own. And that's how it began. The progression of hip hop fashion and brands can be traced pretty linearly. When you think about the 80s, you think more about people like Dapper Dan, April Walker, Shirt Kings, different boutiques that were really community based and neighborhood based. When you started getting into the 90s, when hip hop was really starting to come into its own and become more commercialized, you start seeing brands like Fubu, Cross Colors, Nietzsche, Mecca, Carl Kanai. We had a whole different customer, a whole different vibe. So we carved out a whole different niche that no one ever saw coming, but it was part of who we were. We single-handedly changed the fit and the direction of young men's fashion because our small was Ralph Lauren's extra large. We figured out we got to get exposure. So we were home watching MTV one day. We started seeing rap videos on MTV. And it was like, we should be able to get to these guys. What are they wearing? They need to be wearing our clothing on there. We contacted every hip-hop artist that we saw on MTV doing a video to connect with them. Because keep in mind, back then, there was no social media, there was no internet, so everyone was glued to the TV. We were not going to be able to sell everybody everything, but we wanted to be consistent with what was going on in the market, so we would miraculously get the designs ahead of time or the colors that Nike and a lot of the other brands would use so that when that new burnt orange sneaker came out from Nike, magically there was a FUBU hoodie with the same exact color available for you. Trying to build a business where you can produce on a level where you can fill those orders was really challenging. Poor Damon with one sewing machine covered with fabric, and I'm constantly bringing more up to him. He's looking at me like, oh my God, what have we got ourselves into? I get turned down my 27 banks. I go on my mother, I said, I got turned down my 27 banks. She said, I didn't know 27 banks existed. My mother goes out and gets a $100,000 loan on my house. My mother moves out, my friends move in, I turn my house into a factory. And then all of a sudden I realized the $100,000 is now $500 because I was paying for raw goods 90 days ahead of time. I was paying for machines, I was paying for salaries, for staff, I was shipping, and I was about to be homeless. I didn't deliver all the clothes. Those weren't business problems that the mainstream brands were facing. They had a built-in infrastructure on how to do this. Good old mom, one last idea. She puts an ad in the newspaper. A million dollars in orders need financing. 33 people call that ad. One of them was a company called Samsung's Textile Division. Criteria was we will manufacture and deliver your clothes. You're gonna have to sell $5 million worth of clothes in three years to keep this deal. I do the deal with Samsung and I sell $30 million worth of clothes in three months. I say energy feeds energy. Once we started making our own, we wanted to see more of that. We wanted to feel more of that. We wanted to be in more of that. And one of my favorite moments in hip hop fashion is when LL Cool J recorded the Gap commercial and wore a FUBU hat and nobody noticed. Gap goes and asks him to perform this commercial and write the actual copy and the lyrics. And they didn't have anybody that really believed or loved hip hop enough to know what FUBU for us, by us was. I, I believe he said something like, I have a funny shaped head. Can I just wear a, a logo? I gotta wear a custom made hat. At that time, LL was known that he will never take his hat off. He was wearing Kango most of the time. They were probably happy that they were not going to be promoting Kango or have to put a big piece of tape on it. He wears a FUBU hat. He puts in the rhyme. G-A-P, gritty, ready to go for us, by us, on the low. G, that's well, this is a clear 
form of rebelling within the system. The Gap does their analytics and finds out that the target market they were trying to hit increased 300% because the kids thought they can get FUBU at the Gap. How easy is this? Welcome to Fresh, Fly, and Fabulous, 50 Years of Hip Hop Style. We birthed this idea several years ago to not only celebrate hip hop in itself and this monumental occasion, but hip hop style. Carl Kanai really was designing for himself and his friends and realized that there was a need for a baggier silhouette. This particular vest was one worn by Tupac. Tupac notoriously told Carl Kanai and April Walker, I'm going to be in your ads and I'm going to rock your stuff, no charge. I was like, yo, Pac, so like, how much would you charge me to do an ad? And he sits down and he gets really quiet. It felt like he stayed quiet for an hour. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, I shouldn't have asked him. Then he looks at me and says, yo, I ain't going to charge you for nothing. He says, you black, I don't charge my people for nothing. It was just the way he was. He just wanted to support the business. He knew what we were faced against. He knew how competitive the fashion industry was. He was very intentional to make sure that I was seen. And I think bigger than everything, it's the fact that I see you and I want the world to see you. He said it was important because I was a black designer. Not that many people knew that the head of Walker Wear was a woman. She didn't want it to be perceived as a women's line because she designed for men. When we started, being an entrepreneur wasn't sexy. People were like, are you crazy? And then put on top of that being a woman, you know? It was definitely a men's world, totally. Never done this for validation of others. You know, I do it for my community, but I also do it because it feeds my soul. I'm committed to the process and my purpose. Another really important American brand in hip hop is Tommy Hilfiger. Snoop Dogg was really excited by the brand and so they gave him clothing and he wore this piece on SNL in 1994. A very important moment for Tommy Jeans because at that critical moment, the very next day, they saw a tremendous uptick in sales. That is the direct correlation between the power of hip hop and the artist and the brand. People like Tommy Hilfiger, some of the early mainstream brands that started to embrace hip hop culture, they were sort of the connector, you know, for then how it became a global phenomenon. The hip hop community embraced me. They understand fashion, they understand the street vibe, and they're creating it and recreating it with different silhouettes, the way they wore the clothes, where they wore the clothes. Kadada Jones, Quincy's daughter, was working for me as my stylist. She said, you have to meet my girlfriend, Aaliyah. We weren't doing women's clothes then. So we took the men's clothes and retailored it to fit Aaliyah. And then we put her in an ad campaign. I got Tommy jeans, what else? He's not my dad, but I got Tommy jeans. <laughs> I remember those pictures of Aaliyah and Tommy so well. It aligned naturally with her tomboyish style. Like it was, it was a little baggy, it was cool. It wasn't trying too hard. Like it just aligned perfectly with who she was already. It went, what is viral now, it went viral then. Hip hop is building. So everybody's taking notice to hip hop fashion and its culture, right? Young white kids is like embracing our music more and more and more. So as the young white kids is embracing the music, it's creating a crossover effect in fashion. Whatever the rappers was wearing, that's what they want to wear. Department stores have had an interesting relationship with streetwear. At the beginning, they were hesitant to participate in anything that was involved in streetwear. I think we have a, a larger hill to climb because we're interpreted as, as definitely not fashion. We're looked at as a trend. Why and I initially went to a lot of the bigger stores, the big department stores, I got resistance such as 
take the hang tag off. And I was like, why? They were like, well, there's four African Americans on there and we don't want those type of people in our store or we don't feel like dealing with a lot of shoplifting or shootouts in the store. I think back in the days, they didn't have the guts to take a chance on hip hop. They never thought hip hop would last. As hip hop started to step into its power and started to have known stars, right? Tupac was a star, LL, Biggie, they became style icons. And then the department stores started taking note that there was an emerging customer base for these designs. I'd like to say congratulations on representing black people right, letting us buy stuff that we like, that we can wear. They go into those stores and they want to see those products and they want to shop those because they see that they want to emulate who Jay-Z represents to them. Once that customer comes in the store and wants the register starts ringing, retailers don't want that register to stop ringing. In 1996, 1997, we went from 30 million to around 100 and change in 98. And then we brought on licenses. And right around 98, 99, we were grossing about $350 million annually. In the late 90s, you still had the FUBU's Carl Kanai's, April Walker's really driving the culture, but then also the mainstream brands stepping in, Baby Fat these kind of brands that would set the tone for this great explosion in hip hop fashion. I met my first husband when I was very young and he had a line called Fat Farm and he wanted to get more into fashion and we started to discuss a women's line that would be like a counterpart to Fat Farm. What was sexy was like the girl wearing the boyfriend's varsity jacket. And I thought that women and their fashion should be so much more. Hip hop is fashion and fashion is hip hop. They go hand in hand. I'm inspired by hip hop and music in general. I'm driven by that world, that is my world. Kimora and Baby Fat just created so much space for women, I think, to feel part of everything that was happening in hip hop culture. I, I love her, I stand her so much. I think she's incredible. She was honestly the blueprint because she brought a, like a sexy element to it that just wasn't there before. I was trying just to make a place for myself. And I think trying to speak for what I thought young women wanted at the time. I thought it should be sexy and dynamic. I wanted it to be bigger than life. Did we say that there was not an ass that that baby fat cat was not on? Did we say that there was not a girl or a woman that did not have baby fat? However she looks, whatever her color, whatever her shape, that was something that I brought to fashion. So yeah, we really did create a movement. We built it into a billion dollar brand. Elite luxury at that time was seeming to shun a lot of what we did. And it was streetwear or urban fashion. I never understood why it was called that. I never knew. Is it because of who made it? Is it because of who buys it? Is, is that a black thing? Is that, what is that? I think a lot of people like to use the word urban. It's more so you can spot it when you see it because it's bold and it's brave and it's unapologetically black. And I think that's the point. That, I mean, you gotta be able to call it something, right? And so I, I'm not mad at the, all these publications giving it a name. What would you name it? Fly. It's, you know, it's, it's just, and I would just say, man, what's fly? You know, or whatever name the young people got for it for the day. You know, oh, that, it, it went from Jiggy. That's fly. Oh, that's lit. <laughs> <laughs> Much more than bling bling, the hip hop economy transcends radio, television, film, fashion, and more, making cash registers ka-ching all around the world. Everyone understands now, hip hop fashion equals sales, it equals money. Everything was embellished, right? Everything had diamonds and pearls and dripping and gold and silver chains. Everything was like larger than life. And then everyone started jumping onto it. Every rapper suddenly has a t-shirt line. Every designer is trying to have some kind of hip hop element, which usually equals some like horrible graffiti font on a t-shirt. And it becomes this great oversaturation of elements of hip hop culture. 
Anytime you have any form of true self-expression in art, once corporate America finds out how they can seize it, make money off of it, they do. In streetwear, authenticity is everything. I believe the tipping point was when everyone realized that it was a commercial opportunity. And once the ambition is money and it's not for the love of the craft, everything changes. But if you look at your data, a hot fashion brand stays hot five to seven years. So when urban brands weren't doing as well, they just kind of said they want to be done with everybody. So the department stores totally moved on a different direction and stopped buying from every urban brand that even existed. I think it's a heartbreaking business if you're not prepared for it. It's like any other art form. You really have to be in it and know your why. And I think that we were all very young. And I think we were all very green. I think that a lot of the brands that started were started by creatives who maybe didn't have the greatest business advice and business acumen. I don't think enough of us got that memo in time or there was enough time before corporate America came in and said, oh, we can take this, and, and they did. Hip hop and the luxury sector have had a very complex relationship from the start. Over the years, you saw that change and you saw the luxury brands understand hip hop's power and influence and how they set style trends. Seeing it constantly as a point of inspiration is fine as long as the black creatives are being credited and brought into the company and not just we brought this person in for a capsule collection or we wanted them to just design this one sneaker. Fast forward to 2017. Gucci's runway show, they send a design down the runway that looks very familiar. The famous Diane Dixon jacket. There was a mahogany mink with Louis Vuitton sleeves. Gucci copied that piece and put it down, took it down the runway with Gucci sleeves in it. When it came down the runway, people obviously, you know, became um, aware of the fact that somebody along the lines had put this up as inspiration and didn't realize that that was accredited to somebody that the black community really loved and cared about. That's the fashion shot that was heard around the world. The internet spoke and Gucci had to answer for it. Gucci reached out. But me being raided all throughout the years, I said, nah, I didn't trust what was happening. I said, if they want to work with me, tell them to come to Harlem. I'm kidding and joking. They came. I said, oh, look like they're serious. I said, well, I have to be able to continue what I'm doing, and that's to be able to create. They said, OK. And I said, I got to be in Harlem. They said, OK. Everything, they said, OK. Scared the hell out of me. So as a result of that, they gave me this atelier, set me up. We were at Dapper Dan's, the uh, atelier. This is an historical moment because this is Gucci comes to Hall. Gucci partners with Dapper Dan. So shall we start with the tour? I think it was a big turning point. I think it was a cornerstone moment. Unfortunately, you know, on the, on the, on the shoulders of this like very complex history, but it did, for better or worse, solidify DAP's importance. Here is one of the collective pieces and the partnership that I did with Dapp Day and Gucci. The idea of Gucci even bringing Dap in really is the fact that so much in culture has changed and also that people have now realized that if you don't give black designers credit for their work, that black people won't support the brand. We gain nothing when we get mad and walk away from a brand. You know, we have everything to gain. When Gucci came and got me, Louis Vuitton had to come get Virgil, a phenomenal talent, right? with LVMH hi hiring Virgil to do Louis Vuitton, I think that they couldn't deny 
that there was a street explosion coming to the luxury world. Virgil's ascendancy and the way he thought and how he understood fashion, streetwear, style elements, style history was happening at a moment in time where the mainstream fashion world knew that they needed someone in a position of leadership that had all of that. He just knew what he was doing inherently because he had the vision. I think the success of Dap and Virgil was is that they were tapped into what people actually wanted and not just what luxury brands predicted people really wanted to wear. But I think luxury brands have seen over the years that this is a multi-billion dollar business and it gives them credibility. If I invite you to the show and put you in the front row and everybody thinks I'm down with the cool kids, but that doesn't mean that when you look at the boardroom, how is that reflected? How are we there? How are we impacting the decisions? I think there's a line between the brands appreciating black culture and then them co-opting culture in the sense of what they do behind the scenes that changes things. Like if you were only bringing in a black person to do something for six weeks and then the rest of the team is not inclusive, I think that there are going to be problems inherently. So to sum it all up, why don't you have people just in your company that look like the people and think like the people you serve? Even though they may have turned their nose up at us, every step of the way they were emulating what was going on in our hoods, our neighborhoods. Other people would always be using various elements of our lifestyle and street style and kind of turning it into a high fashion thing. So you may say, oh yeah, they turned their nose up at us. And in fact they did and they do and still to this day, but there was always some aspect that I feel that was being robbed. People said streetwear wasn't gonna get past the 90s. They thought that was the end of it. Now, all the fashion top designers took all those silhouettes, took all those oversized t-shirts we used to do, took the big logo we used to do, took all those things and just cleaned it up a little bit, toned down the colors a little bit, made it a little bit different, put it on a runway, did some cleaner ads with it, and tried to make it seem like, oh, Look what we've created. You didn't create anything. You just remixed what was already there. Hip hop, the music, the culture, the artists, the vibe controls fashion. wanted us on their runways. Our community made that fashion happen. And I'm so proud to be here to celebrate 50 years of this culture that has unified us, made some of us rich, but inspired the rest of us. You are not ready, can I just tell you? Can I just tell you? Let the drip begin. Hip hop fashion is endless. Hip hop fashion has become almost a language unto itself. And I think it says what it has said from the beginning. We don't need your cosign. We don't need your permission to look a certain way or be a certain way. We're gonna be ourselves and we're gonna use fashion and what we look like to communicate that. Hip hop fashion has had many names from urban fashion to hip hop fashion to streetwear, but it's fashion, it's global, it's a force to be reckoned with. We created all of the best of the best. Like your faves, faves, we did that. 
And I'm saying we as a genre, we as a club, like my graduating class. I'm taking the whole yearbook section for us, the whole book of it. Like four years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, right? It's us. And we're hot as shit. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.